Good evening. Um, Roger and I work at Park, and we spend a lot of time thinking about what is the next big technology and how people may work with it. And we have a vision about the Internet of Things, and that is to put you in charge. People often don't realize the direction and the significance of new technologies. So, as you already know, Henry Ford once famously said that uh, his customers would have liked a faster horse, but the real problem was to create a transportation device that was different. But increasingly today, our problems cannot be solved with a horse or one car, but with solutions that empower us, each of us, to find our own solutions to our problems. How do we approach problems? The lady you see here was the pinnacle of office technology, and uh, she was a 200 word per, 200 mi uh, word per minute typer, and, um, uh, but we had to, but while the world was trying to figure out how to type even faster, we had to create a different office with personal computers, uh, printers, and word processors. And equally, the future of communications wasn't a faster horse for this postman, not even the telephone or the fax machine, but high-speed internet networks, which allowed us to transmit any kind of information. An internet that allowed each and every one of us to embark on entirely new things. And if the internet of things is to be successful, it has to be able to do the same. And part of that is how we make things. Today you see with the rise of 3D printing that it becomes possible to print a pair of shoes with the same ease as used to edit and print a Word document. But we think that printing is, about, is on the verge of another revolution, potentially enabling us to print smart things. So that we can make them, we can make them smart and we can make them part of the Internet of Things. So imagine smart inks that behave as semiconductors, emit light, behave as sensors, or you can form them into batteries. Imagine these inks put into printers so that we can print smart intelligence instead of just colors or shapes. Imagine chips, microchips formed into inks, and use these materials to print electronics. We're just exploring what is possible with this kind of technology, and for example, with the use of these circuits that contain about a thousand organic transistors printed on a plastic sheet. A lot of these technologies are about the same stage as uh, the transistor radio was 50 years ago, and which was the, actually the first application of silicon. It wasn't the computer. And the question for us is that what we can use these printed circuits for, what is the equivalent of that transistor radio that we can start putting into applications today. As it turns out, using just a few printed transistors, sensors, and maybe a printed display, we can define the liver functionalities that, for example, track the uh, environment of a product as it moves through the supply chain. And this is accessible by printing the, the circuits. And there are about 10 trillion devices that are manufactured and thrown away every day, disposable devices. And the, a lot of these will only require just a little bit more functionality, more intelligence than the barcode can offer today. The Internet of Things needs to offer some solution for this vast number of really simple devices to be able to expand the very edge of the network. And the way to, to do this, really, that makes sense is to print them the same way that we print today newspapers. Just because there's a, such a huge amount of these sensors that you, you print today, uh, that you wouldn't be able to do it with a different kind of technology. And the printing of memory devices based on, on uh, similar kind of presses is already in use and practiced by companies like Synfilm Electronics. But how far can we push the technology, the idea of printing smart objects? Well, NASA puts a really ambitious goal ahead of us to measure the environment in Mars and measure that with devices that contain a variety of sensors to look at the electric fields, the ambient temperature, the gases on the surface. And their idea is to create a whole network of thin 
on-demand printed spacecraft devices that are so lightweight that they literally float down to the surface of the planet. And that is a, a, a really amazing idea. If you think about it, this means the Internet of Things is going to space. And a lot of these devices, a lot of the solutions in these devices will then come back to Earth, to our personal devices. And we will have many different smart objects around us. Some of them will be mass manufactured like the smart labels. Some of them will make on demand or order them to our own specifications, the way we want to see them. Some of them you might be able to download as a design and modify and print, for example, a wearable uh, health monitoring device on your own printer. The important thing is that you should be able to define what kind of devices and what kind of solutions you want to see as part of this internet of things around you. And it's all going to be great having thousands and thousands of these devices around us, but what does it mean in terms of the huge amount of data that will come and go between them? And that's what Roger is going to tell us about. The talking stick, please. So for these things to become an internet of things, they need to communicate. The internet that we have today, though, might not be the appropriate way to do it. And to explain what I mean by this, I'm going to take you back to 2400 BC, when the postal system as we know it found its roots. They invented the mailbox. and. Uh, Pharaohs would get messages out to the cities by sending scrolls around, and that evolved over thousands of years to a system that you could write a letter, put it in an envelope, put someone's name on the front, and hand it to a courier, and the courier would deliver your message. The problem with this, even after thousands of years of evolution into the middle of the last millennium, was that it didn't scale. The names were the first problem. If I wanted to send a message to John, well, the courier needed to know what John. So we, we added a, a surname on there, John Smith. Well, he's the blacksmith in town, OK. But that didn't really get to the heart of the problem. The real problem was that people move around. So you've got couriers out aiming at a moving target. To get around this problem, we needed a breakthrough. And we needed something that I think is kind of interesting and people take for granted. And that is the address. The simple thing, it's just a, a structured name, right? It, it has a, a region, a city, a street, and a number. And that's enough information for a courier to get the letter to where you want it to go. Computers work in much the same way. They actually have addresses. So when packets are moving around in the network, they have addresses. They're going to an address. The problem is, in 2008, the number of devices on the internet surpassed the number of people on the planet. The problem is that many of the devices that are going onto the internet now are mobile devices that move around. The problem is that if we can print devices, we're going to make them and destroy them with abandon. The problem is that our foundation, the thing that we address, is no longer steady. So what do we do with an internet that looks like this? I work on a project called content-centric networking. And the idea of content-centric ne networking is to put information at the center of the network. You send packets to information. You request information by name. You don't care where it came from. This has some interesting implications. For example, with privacy, security, and trust, right now, the model is that you've got two devices and they talk over a secure link. That doesn't work so well sometimes, though, because the data is what I really care about. And if you have some sort of uh, something that generates data that I'm not interested in or is the wrong information, or say you have a virus or even a Trojan horse on that other machine, I still get the data securely, but I can't trust it. Content-centric networking changes the relationship of trust to it's now between me and the data. So each packet can be signed. Each packet can give you the security that you need to make the system both safe and manageable. 
So imagine that we've got this world, we've got printable smart things, and we've got a secure, manageable network, and I need a new pair of shoes. So I go and order it online. I download the shoes, and I print them. Of course, I've, I've customized them for my particular foot. I print them out, and they've got sensors in them that tell me that I'm too fat, that tell me that I don't walk enough, and of course, I've figured out exactly how I would want them to annoy me, but the information from them will join my digital self online, right? It'll be part of my digital persona. It is the constant thing. The structure of the information can stay. While information is flying back and forth on the network and moving around at an incredible speed, the structure is something that we can address. We can put addresses on it. We can name the data. And so I've got these smart shoes, and they're adding to my information. And then I get tired of them, and I put them in the shredder and print out another pair. The information stream will, ma will be maintained. It'll be continuous. In order to make a vision like this happen, we need a secure, uh, safe internet that's manageable. We need things that are intelligent and available on demand. In short, you should join us as we reinvent the internet. And reinvent things. Thank you very much.